Longtime voice of the Jays, Buck Martinez, still at the top of his game. And the Blue Jays looking to sweep the Red Sox. Martinez first gained fans as a player. They showed their support through his battle with cancer. You know, we all think we're 10 foot tall and bulletproof. All in all, a half century of stories. And I got to hear some of his best stories when I sat down with Martinez at Rogers Center, where the Blue Jays are still in contention for the playoffs. May 10th, 1981. Does that date ring a bell? That's, that's the day that you got traded to the Toronto Blue Jays. You can be honest. What was your reaction when you found out that was going to happen? I was um, kind of disappointed. Yeah. I had been here before, obviously, yep. having played with the Royals when we came here in 77, the, the inaugural season. But when I arrived at Pearson, it was a damp, dark, rainy night. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? And I thought I would be here for a year. I honestly did. I thought I'd play for the Blue Jays for one year, and then I'd be finished and move on. Of course, it went on much longer than that. You became a beloved member of this team, of the Blue Jays community. I want to fast forward to a piece of video that I know Jays fans know really well, and you know really well. Runner barreling into you at home plate, breaks your leg. It's going to be in time, the collision. Bradley Bulls Martinez over. Tom Somehow you have the presence of mind to throw the ball to third, and eventually the runner's out. What's interesting, I mean, it shows what a gamer you were, obviously, but it also shows how much baseball has changed. Like, you can't do that to a catcher right. these days, or at least you shouldn't. And I just wonder more generally, as you reflect on, on baseball then and now, what, what are your thoughts? Baseball has changed a lot, obviously. And I was fortunate to come into baseball in 1969 with the expansion Kansas City Royals. I was 20 years old. I was as green as any artificial turf you've ever seen, but... Baseball's changed dramatically, obviously. At that time, pitchers hit. DH didn't come in until 73. Mm -hmm. uh, minimum salary, which I made for about four years, was $10,000 wow. a year. And when I tell players that these days, they say, a week? <laughs> and I go, no, no, a year. And uh, it was different. Whether he hits or not. Look out. I was watching a preseason game in Arizona this year, and there was a clock on the field. And I, I, it just was jarring for me. Of course, that is part of the game now. It's part of the changes to try to make baseball quicker and more appealing maybe to modern-day fans. How do you feel about that? I, I think modern-day fans is the key because uh, our attention span is very short. And, and children uh, don't want to sit through three hours of baseball. Or they don't want to sit through 15 minutes of anything, basically. <laughs> but I think what happens is... We got to wait. That's the way we used to play. Pitchers would get on the mound and say, hey, get in the box. You're the next out. Let's go. Pitchers would dictate the tempo of the game. Baseball had to incorporate the clock to bring that into the game. And this is much closer to the baseball that I played in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Oh, really? Yes, yeah. very close to it. It's the same tempo. We used to play games under two hours. Wow. And the pitchers would get on the mound. The players would play. They would hit. We didn't have walk-up music. Mm -hmm. We didn't have brands. We didn't have any of that. We played baseball, and uh, we wanted to play a good, clean, quick game, and the fans enjoyed that. High fly ball. Get up, ball. Get up, ball. This one's going to go. Home run, Randall Quinton. I love watching you do a game because I learned so much. You, you, you can tell me what the next pitch is going to be. You can explain why that is. And so there, there's just, I could have picked anything, but there's a, there's a piece of video with Jose Barrios on, on the mound. And there you are kind of predicting what the next pitch will be, which is fantastic. But the other thing is, he ends up making a pitch that you didn't like. Come back with another fastball. Don't go back to the breaking ball. Breaking ball, line fair, past a diving Chapman and down the line. You just felt it was too predictable, and, and you said that on the air, gently, like you weren't mean about it. Too predictable. And I just wonder, what is that like to be, like, you know, you, you work for a broadcaster that's owned by the same team as, the same company as the team. Uh, you see these players all the time. How do you figure out how, how hard to push or how far to push? It took me a while. Uh, when I first stepped off the field, and I had a unique opportunity because I stopped playing in 86, and I was broadcasting on television in 87. When Martinez signed with TSN and gave up baseball for broadcasting, 
He closed the book on a pro baseball career that started 22 seasons ago in the minor leagues. So I went right from being a player to being a broadcaster. And I had some moments where I thought, wow, I don't like this. This is not good. And I felt uncomfortable. Uh, I didn't want to criticize my teammates. Those were guys I just finished playing with. But I had a chance to work with a, a producer that was the producer director for This Week in Baseball for 40 years, hmm. Harry Coyle. And Harry Coyle told me, you have credibility because you played so long. And as long as you're not questioning their integrity or talking about their morality or something like that, baseball is fair game for you because you've done it. And that really helped me a lot. My job is to relate the game to the audience. That's what my job is. I, I saw a little excerpt from uh, John Gibbons' uh, podcast where he said when he was the manager of the Jays, he used you as a sounding board sometimes because he respected your baseball knowledge so much. Uh, that's kind of cool. Does that still happen where the manager sort of says to you, hey, like, how do you think things are looking out there? Yes, it does still happen. And um, I'm proud of that. Yeah. They know that they can trust me. They know that I'm not going to jeopardize any of their relationships with players and they can give me some background that's going to help me as a broadcaster. But they also ask me my opinion about, you know, I've been in the game over 50 years. So a year and a half ago, we learned that you had cancer. I think you know this, right across the country, people were really moved by that. In Vancouver, I was getting, you know, I have no connection to you, obviously, directly, I, I, but people were sending me text messages saying, have you heard the news? Like, a lot of us were, 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 were saddened by that. Um, how was it for you, the, the, those, those months of, of being away and, and treatment? Nobody wants to hear those words, obviously. And uh, as an athlete, you know, we all think we're 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And when you hear that, it kind of takes you back. But I have a phenomenal wife. We've been married for 48 years. Oh. And as soon as we heard that, she said, we got this. And um, the, the response I got from the people in Canada and in North America in general was incredible. And it helped get me through the treatment. And it helped me understand that maybe I can help somebody else get through this treatment. Mm -hmm. But I knew we would get through it. And I knew that in the end, I would be able to come back. The, the doctor told me, he said, you'll probably miss the rest of the season uh, with this treatment. It'll probably take you that long to get back. I said, no, I won't. I won't miss the rest of the season. July 26th, 2022, you came back here. Back in the broadcast booth, Buck Martinez. And I'm sure for the people who are in the seats, Certainly for those of us who have watched the video, it was a very moving time. What was it like for you? It was incredible. Um, when the day comes that I retire, I won't need a send off. I've already had that. It was wonderful. And my son Casey and his family, Jennifer and the three girls were here to share that moment with me. It was incredible. And. Um, I didn't know they were going to stop the game. I didn't know anything about that. But when the players came out on the field, that was pretty special. It makes you understand that you might be doing things right. And uh, it just goes back to the first day I came to Canada when I thought, I'll be here for a year. And here we are many, many years later, and the country has embraced me. They have allowed me to bring the baseball game into their homes. And when I came back, that was like, okay, I, I guess we did it right. Well, as I say, for me, you know, I don't know a lot about baseball, but I learned so much about the game watching and listening to you. And, and a lot of us really do appreciate that. And I just wonder for you at this stage in your career, first of all, you mentioned the R word, retirement. Like, do you, do you, do you have any sense of when that might happen? When I got back, I thought I did. And now that I've done games, I don't have any idea about that. I That's enjoy a good it thing. so much. Yeah. It's, uh, it's such a great privilege to be involved in the game and be around the best athletes in the world and watch what they do every day. And it's, um, it's a special opportunity. And you know what? My goal is to bring something to the audience every night that they didn't know. It might not happen tonight. 
might not happen tomorrow, but someday it's going to happen, and I'll have the background story to tell you, and you'll go, wow, that's pretty cool. You know what? Mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. Really nice talking to you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Something I just noticed watching that interview now, he didn't know what the questions were going to be. Every answer just has this beautiful arc. It's, it's a, it's a well-crafted answer, and listening to it just sounds, it's just, it's just like listening to a summer baseball game. Really nice. An Alberta trans teen speaks out about the struggle to get appropriate care. He was like, um, asking me really weird questions, like what if I wanted to get pregnant someday? what he went through, and the calls for action. A trans teen desperate for health care is denied a simple referral to a clinic. He refused to do that for us. That sort of story, not uncommon. It's really fear and lack of knowledge. Yes, perseverance can pay off. It feels really good. But for many, still a waiting game. Teachers are alive without us. Paige Parsons breaks down one person's journey to show you the roadblocks to care in different parts of Canada. What was it like going to school here? Um, it was pretty rough. It was, yeah, it wasn't very easy. I was kind of like an outcast. Being a transgender kid or teen living anywhere in Canada comes with challenges. But for people in rural areas or small towns like this, it can be especially tough, encountering attitudes that challenge their very existence. We're allowing them to be chemically castrated and sterilized. This is more than a teaspoon of poop in the cooking batch. MLA Jennifer Johnson later apologized for that comment made before she was elected. But encountering homophobic and transphobic attitudes isn't unusual. That's why we're in Pinoca in central Alberta, finding out what it's like to be a trans teen, fighting for acceptance, especially when you need health care. I came out to a select few people and like, immediately it was like something clicked. Pro Hayden Kay was 16 when he told his close friends and family that he was transgender. His family was supportive, especially his mom. She booked him an appointment with their family doctor to ask for a referral to a gender clinic in Edmonton about 100 kilometers north of Pinoca. But the call with the doctor didn't go well. He was like, um, asking me really weird questions, like what if I wanted to get pregnant someday? What if I had a husband someday? I think he asked me like, what if you want to keep your boobs? Like it was so weird and invasive. We just wanted a referral to a gender clinic. Just a referral was all that we wanted and then it would be out of his hands. He refused to do that for us. Trans youth say gender affirming healthcare can be life saving. But depending on where you live in Canada, it's hard to get, and the wait can be years long. But there are healthcare providers across the country providing this kind of care. They want to make it easier for kids and teens to get it. So affirming care is sort of a bigger term, but it really means you know meeting the kid where they are. That's what endocrinologist Dr. Daniel Metzger wants to do. Metzger co-authored a new position statement by the Canadian Pediatric Society, endorsing affirming care for transgender and gender diverse kids and teens. They have no legal support, but they also have no medical support in some places, or if they had medical support, it's been taken away. So, um, you know, the unfortunate fact is that the suicide rate among trans youth is the highest of all. That goes down very rapidly once a child is just talks to one grown up in charge and says, yeah, we believe you, let's help you out. Metzger says many kids and teens are only interested in social transition, changing their appearance or their name. Surgery isn't common for adolescents and certain types are reserved for adults. Hormone replacement therapy can be an option for some youth. Before getting a prescription, they need to be assessed by a mental health care provider and then are often referred to a specialist like Metzger. That process can take years. Delay can mean going through puberty in a gender that you don't identify with, causing significant distress and a need for more intensive medical treatments later in life. Any family doctor can do gender affirming care and I think that's the important thing to take home. Uh, what is lacking, however, is the training for family physicians and even specialists. So it's really fear and lack of knowledge. Fear of the unknown, fear of not being taught, fear of doing something wrong.
supporting and At his gender clinic in Edmonton, Dr. James Makokas sees patients not only from all over Alberta, but from other provinces. Makokas both counsels and diagnoses patients with gender dysphoria and may prescribe hormones. We have a long waiting list of people who are wanting to access care with few clinicians who um, are willing to take over the care once the patient has started on hormones. We have... Makokas started an informal training program, inviting other physicians to shadow him to learn how to do gender-affirming care themselves. And that's the hope, is that we have family doctors willing to take over the care and in fact start and initiate treatment um, within, their, within their own practices. <laughs> Transgender and non-binary identity issues are becoming increasingly politicized. And misinformation about gender-affirming care is rampant. It is very alarming. The climate is changing. We've gone from being tolerant to one now that is shifting more um, towards violent rhetoric. Kennedy says there are serious access issues when it comes to gender-affirming health care, especially in rural communities. The reality is that politicians need to start looking at the, the serious consequences of what it means to not provide the care that people need. Back in Pinoca, a pediatrician Crow Hayden K saw for a different health issue diagnosed him with gender dysphoria and referred him to a gender clinic. It took longer than he hoped, but he started taking testosterone shortly before his 18th birthday. It's like literally been life changing. Um, I just, it, it, like, it feels so much better, even with all the weird, like, second puberty stuff. Things are changing for me. It feels really good. Um, and I'm so much happier than I was, like, in high school. Hayden Kay is planning to leave Pinoca. He hopes to move to Calgary and attend art school. I do hope that this place can become more accepting and um, safer for queer folk who live here. And Paige Parsons joins us from Edmonton. Paige, we have seen political parties at the provincial and federal level wade into gender identity and gender affirming health care issues. What did you learn about how the politics of all of this is affecting young people? Ian, the teens and families I spoke with want what we all want. They want to feel safe and they want to be respected. And they hope that politicians debating identity or what medical care should be allowed uh, will treat them as real people and understand just how critical or even life-saving gender-affirming health care can be. All right, Paige, thank you. An unwanted guest that forced a wedding party to improvise. All of a sudden it was like pivot, 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 and everyone really came together. The journey towards tying the knot in a fish plant? That's next in our moment. This is a photo from Brittany Schneer and Drew Mitchell's wedding yesterday in Nova Scotia. And yep, they're holding live lobsters because the reception was held in a fish plant. Tropical Storm Lee forced a last minute change of venue but didn't stop the magic on their special day. What may just be the most maritime marriage in history is our moment. To have a fisherman marry a sailor in a fish plant in Blanford, Nova Scotia. During a hurricane. During a hurricane is one of the most iconic things you could ever do. We were supposed to get married in a beautiful tent on my father's like home. And that was not looking like a viable option. And my dad pitched the idea of using his fish plant. They have backup generators, so you wouldn't even know there's a hurricane. And instantly I was like, that's it. Like it just felt right. It felt so right. And all of a sudden it was like pivot, pivot, pivot. So we decided to outfit this whole large room with concrete floors and white walls into a stunning indoor wedding. It's a huge, huge facility. And those tanks are filled with lobsters and the guests were loving that. One guest wandered off and got themselves stuck in the freezer. So that was really funny. Most people have never even seen a fish plant. So like to be able to open the curtain and all of a sudden you're in like an active fish plant in Nova Scotia. It was iconic. Also, they are the coolest couple ever. Haven't you been to a wedding where even the slightest, you know, like a moment of clouds has everybody panicking? Uh, it looks like they're ready for anything. 
Thank you for being with us. You can watch us anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hannah Mansing in Vancouver. Take care.